All right. I got to tell you, I do not care for the story of Mary and Martha. Or maybe the better way of saying that is, I don't care for how the church has used that story for generations now as kind of a bludgeon to say this is the right way to experience worship, experience the presence of God. And I, don't, I particularly don't like the way this passage has been used as a way to tell women in particular how they should experience the presence of God. And I say that in particular because one of the very first weeks that I was ever in ministry in a local church, I had somebody in the church come up to me and tell me that she was a Martha. And it really confused me because I didn't think that was her name. But she said, I'm a Martha. My sister's a Mary. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know you and your sister. And that, those aren't your names. What are you talking about? And she's like, she's like, you know, in the Bible, they've got the story of Mary and Martha. And Mary's the one that sits around and doesn't do anything. And Martha's the one that's always busy and hectic. I'm a Martha. I'm like, oh, OK. Took me a while to remember her name wasn't Martha. <laughs> but this passage in particular has been used in a way, I don't know any other passage in scripture that has been used this way to say that there is one particular personality type amongst one particular gender, that this is how this group of people should experience worship, it should experience the life of the church. And I think this all has to do with the fact that we have taken the story of Mary and, of Mary and Martha and we have read something into it that's not there. So our question this morning, you submitted questions to me for this summer. Our question this morning is revolving around this idea of Jesus and the disciples and Mary all having been fed by Martha, and yet Martha seems to be the one who is condemned in this story. So what gives? Why does Jesus seem to condemn the one who works her faith? Well, to first talk about this, we need to talk about the theology of works righteousness. The idea that our good works is what gets us more righteous, gets us salvation, gets us into heaven. This idea that if we do enough good things, we will receive salvation. And part of the reason I don't like the story of Mary and Martha is because the church has latched onto that as a proof text that faith is better than doing good works. That all we need is good faith. We don't actually need to actually do anything with that faith. Martha models a character who is saved through her faith, her, her works, and Mary is modeled as a character who is saved by her faith. The problem I have is I don't think that was Luke's intention when he wrote this gospel, and I don't think that was Jesus' intention when he said these words. And part of the reason I think that is because Luke is very careful about where he places this story. You don't notice that if you're just coming to church on Sunday and hearing it preached, but Luke is very careful of putting this story right after the story of the Good Samaritan. So right after Jesus tells a parable about someone whose good works leads to righteousness, he tells a story about somebody whose faith seems to lead to righteousness. And maybe what Jesus is getting at is that it's not faith that gets us to righteousness and it's not works that gets us to righteousness. It's how we enter into faith and how we enter into our good works. Maybe it's the mindset we take with us. So what is Jesus actually condemning? Because I think when we figure out what Jesus is actually condemning, we'll start to understand something about our lives. You notice he does not once condemn the fact that Martha has been working to make her home a place where people are welcome. He doesn't once condemn the fact that she has been cooking, cleaning, setting tables. He doesn't condemn the work. In fact, we see over and over again 
in the words of Jesus, in the practices of the early church, that good works, that people who put their faith into work are praised. In fact, in this story, Martha's actions are described as diaconal, which is where we get the word for deacon, which is a set aside office in the church of those who are particularly called to put their faith into action in the world. So Jesus and the early church both seemed to think that putting our faith into action was important. So I don't think Jesus is condemning Martha because she has been busy at work doing something good. I think Jesus is condemning her mindset. What does Jesus say? Martha, he says, you are worried and distracted by many things. Not that you've been busy. Not Martha, you've been busy doing work for us. He says, it is the worry and distraction that are the problem. And not just worried and distracted by a couple things. Martha, he says, you are worried and distracted over many things. It is not the action of serving that Jesus is challenging. It is a mindset that leads us into worry and anxiety that Jesus wants to challenge. Because worry and anxiety, they do real harm in our lives. They do real harm to our bodies, to our mindset, and they even do real harm to our faith. Let me tell you what the science behind anxiety tells us. The science tells us that when we're anxious, when we're worried, our heart rates increase. The science tells us that our blood pressure skyrockets. The science tells us that people who are worried and anxious have higher degrees of cardiovascular problems, digestive issues. Science tells us that our immune systems are weakened by worry and anxiety. One of our first classes together in undergrad, Heather and I were in a class where at the end of the year we were shown a video about how stress affects telomeres, the little end caps of our DNA. And I know one person in particular came away from that more stressed because the idea of stress causing physical harm was stressful in of itself. Stress, worry, anxiety cause all these physical symptoms in our lives, but they also affect our minds. When we're stressed, when we're worried, when we're distracted by many things, we have a hard time regulating our emotions. We get short-tempered. We get depressed. We have less energy. We're prone to panic attacks. Worry, anxiety, stress, distraction, all takes a toll on our bodies and our minds, but it also does something to our faith. It bogs us down in falling back on what is familiar. When we become worried, anxious, stressed out, it becomes harder to envision something new in our faith. And we begin to start thinking that other people should experience faith the same way we do. Notice Martha wants Mary to experience faith the same way she does. It's okay to experience our faithfulness in different ways. Some experience faithfulness more through the contemplative moment, while others experience faithfulness more through the serving of others, while others experience faithfulness more through the music or the word. There is no shortage of ways to experience our faith. And it's when we begin to feel anxious and stressed out that we begin to think that others should be experiencing it the same way we do. There's a reason why throughout scripture there are over 300 times 
when we are told to lower the stress, lower the anxiety, lower the fear. I think this is a more meaningful interpretation of the story of Mary and Martha for our 21st century church. And I think this is a message that isn't just for those who identify as Marys or identify as Marthas or identify as women. I think this is a message that everyone in the church can identify with today because I think we have developed a society of Marthas. I think we have developed a society of people who are stressed out, who are anxious, who are distracted by many things. And I think it might be killing us. I did some research from the American Psychiatric Association this past week. They do studies every year on anxiety. And here are some of the numbers they published for 2023. 70% of American adults were anxious about keeping themselves or their families safe. 68% were anxious about keeping their identity safe. 66 were anxious about their health. 65% were anxious about paying bills. 59% were anxious about the impacts of climate change. 50% were anxious about the opioid epidemic. 45% were anxious about the impact of emerging technology on day-to-day -day life. And all these numbers, they keep track year after year. These numbers keep going up. There was one year in the last four years where the numbers dipped down, but then they shot right back up again. We are a people who are worried and anxious about many things. We are a culture of Martha's. I don't think this is a story about one sister who did all the work and one sister who sat around listening to Jesus all day. I think this is a story about one sister who lived her life anxiously and one who was trying to get away from that. What if we all made an effort to reduce the anxiety? to reduce the distraction. The word that Luke uses in the Greek language to describe Martha is that she is pulled in two directions. I got this image of, you know, a tug of war rope, trying desperately to go in two different directions, and at some point something has got to give. How often have we been pulled in two directions, three, four, five, a dozen directions? How many times has our anxiety level crept up without us even realizing it? How often have we let the stresses of day-to-day -day life take the physical, mental, spiritual toll on our lives? Jesus says there's a better way. When Jesus says, Martha, your sister's chosen the better way. Maybe that's Jesus telling us there is a better way. And maybe the better way is simply allowing yourself to experience the presence of God no matter what you are called to do. Whether you're called to sit on the floor and listen, or whether you're called to be setting the tables, whether you're called to be baking in the oven all day, or whether you're called to be reading the book all day, whatever it is you're doing, whether you're setting the table or studying your Bible, whether you're spending time with friends, or whether you're driving to work, or whether you're called to care for children, whatever you are doing, what if the invitation is to do it with a trust that God is present? in what you are doing. Whatever it is you are called to do. And we have some people in this church that have been called to some amazing ministries that keep them as busy as you can imagine. And then we have some people in this church who have been called to a more contemplative kind of lifestyle. What if we saw both as valid, 
both as important and both as places where God is present. And what if simply allowing ourselves to know that God is present in all these places? What if that is enough to say it's okay? I can take the anxiety down a level. I can take the stress down a level. I can take the worry down a level. I can take the distractions down a level. I can stop be, be being pulled in so many different directions. And I can find myself being pulled towards Christ. What if we read the story of Mary and Martha, not as a story of condemnation, but as a story of invitation? that Martha is being invited to see Christ present in all the work she is called to do. Friends, let's be in prayer together. Lord, help us to see your presence. Help us to see your presence around a dinner table, around a communion table, around a dishwasher, around a movie night. Help us to see your presence and help us to feel that your presence is helping to ratchet down the worries and the distractions and the anxieties that might otherwise take over our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.